Bread to Win. Brought to you by Inglis, the Inglis May Sale Series. Mayors, Yearlings and Wheelings, Riverside Stables, May 2-9. to nine. I'm Caroline Searcy. Welcome to another week of Bread to Win. This week we recap some of the big group ones on day two of the championships at Royal Randwick and touch on plenty of stallion updates in Oshorse News. The Busy Bees in Cambridge starts Farm Life and the Inglis Graduate of the Week. Plus an extended interview with the man behind the China Horse Club, T.O.R. King and Aston Bloodstock's Wilf Mueller in Arrowfield starts the Horsey Major Love Racing. A big week in the Bloodstock world so let's recap in Oshorse News. Plenty of news around this week, including the announcement by Widden Star they'll have two new stallions at their Victorian base this year, joining Nakoni and Star Witness. SA Derby and Underwood Stakes winner Russian Camelot and Danehill and Kindergarten Stakes winner Doubtland were paraded at Widden's new base near Romsey for a number of Victorian breeders on Sunday. Russian Camelot will stand at a fee of $22,000 and Doubtland at $16,500. Kiora Stud has announced Golden Slipper winner Farnan by not a single doubt will stand his first season at $55,000 having won five of eight starts and $2.5 million. His pedigree, the great cross of Redoute's Choice and Street Cry through his group winning dam Tallow. New Haven Park in southwestern New South Wales have announced their new sire, New Zealand Group 1 winning two-year-old by Savabile, Tiakau's Cool as a Beal, will stand his first season for $16,500. Ole Kirk has arrived at his new home for season 2021, Vinery Stud. The Talon Dirt, Golden Rose and Caulfield Guineas winner is by Written Tycoon, from a full sister to sprinting champion Black Caviar, and he's a great outcross for the huge number of Danehill line mares in Australia. G1 Goldmine's affinity matrix of Ole Kirk's sire, Written Tycoon, shows that from looking at seven generations of his Group 1 winners, Danehill is found in 36% of them, while the Great Breed Shaper appears in 47% of Written Tycoon's stakes winners, including including his most recent black type success stories, Dosh, Finance Tycoon, Enthar, Kalashnikov and Capitalist. When Written Tycoon is the grandsire, that increases to an incredible 80% of his stakes winners with Dane Hill on the dam side. And take a look at the G1 Goldmine Stallion match for the Vinery Stallions who already have runners if you're looking to see how your mare matches up with all the Vinery Stallions. The Grey Flash is now an Everest legend. Breeders are getting behind the world's richest race on turf as Arrowfield starred partners with the star to secure a slot in the Everest for the next three years. While Godolphin has also taken a slot, having had Bivouac run an exciting second in 2020 and other place getters trekking and Osborne Bulls in past runnings. And finalists for the 2021 Australian Stud and Stable Staff Awards have been confirmed, with a huge representation of workers making the judging an extremely robust and fascinating undertaking. There wasn't much between any of the shortlisted candidates, and the finalists are in the leadership category Dave Hanratty from Yarradale Stud in Western Australia and Sam Parks from Godolphin Woodlands in New South Wales. Horsemanship finalists are Adam Shankley from Arrowfield Stud and Mandy Radica from Michael Lakey Stables in Queensland. Dedication to racing finalists are Lindsay Parks, Gary Fennessy and John Brady from the Waterhouse Bot Stable in Sydney. Dedication to breeding finalists are Steve Bryan from Twin Hills Stud and Carla Alafon from Victoria's City View Farm. The administration and ancillary finalists are Magic Millions, Cassandra Simmons and Jess Hood from Arrowfield Stud. Thoroughbred care and welfare is between Queensland's Jordan Priest and Victoria's Jade Willis and the newcomer category finalists are Fiona Bailey of My Eustace Racing and Jack Cripps from McAvoy Mitchell. The award presentation will take place on the 26th of May on the Gold Coast.
and a Dave goes back to back. The beast of Britain's done it. Saturday's racing at Royal Randwick contained a number of highlights, but the battle of the $4 million Queen Elizabeth stakes was a remarkable result for all connected with back-to-back -back winner a Dave. Very elegant was gallant again in defeat. A Dave is a son of Nureyev line stallion Pivotal, who retired from stud duties earlier this year after a 28-year career at Cheveley Park in the UK. The English graduate of the week was none other than Doncaster winner Natoya, who added another Group 1 to her CV with victory in the Queen of the Turf Stakes. The daughter of Sebring from the family of Absolutely was bought for only $20,000 through session two of the 2015 Inglis Easter Yearling Sale. The mayor is entered for this year's chairman's sale at Riverside on Friday, May 7. And the Inglis early April online sale was topped by the Snitzel Mayor Iguasu Falls in Fold to Brutal, bought by the Lofty Group for $167,000. Top seller from the Godolphin entries was Raul, seen here running second to Black Opal winner Kalash the three-year-old was bought for $145,000 by Sean Driver of Corinda Bloodstock to be aimed at the Kosciuszko. Entries for the late April online sale close at midnight on Wednesday, April 21. The China Horse Club is widely recognised around the world for its distinctive red and gold star colours and its investments in Group 1 winners from Kentucky Derbies to Golden Slippers. I caught up with the man behind China Horse Club, T.O.R. King, to hear about their plans for the future at the recent Inglis Easter Yearling Sale. But it is a complete runaway for Improbable. Our King, it's fabulous to sit down with you and have a chat about all things China Horse Club. Welcome back to Sydney and you've been here for some time now. Well, thank you Caroline and uh, yes, uh, 2013 is to be precise how we started the China Horse Club venture in Australia and New Zealand particularly. You've developed so much, you now have a farm, the Chase down in the Southern Highlands of New South Wales, but you know overall the whole of China Horse Club is, you know, from race horses, you've won the Golden Slipper with Stay Inside this year, the Stallions are flying, you have the first of your sire, Russian Revolution, those yearlings being sold this year. Has it, has it grown, you know, more than you thought it would in such a short time? To be honest, the, um, the philosophy of uh, China Horse Club, uh, I think we continue to focus on a couple areas. Breeding wasn't the initial ideas, but it evolved, as you can see, and uh, based on the, uh, the winners that we have purchased from the yearlings, Russian Revolution is one example. But I think we also pride ourselves in, into networking businesses, bringing members around the world, racing first and foremost, and later on, uh, get them to be interested in overall horse industries and let on buying broodmare to support the stallions. So all in, yeah, I think for the last six, seven years, we have been uh, actively supporting a lot of uh, upstart, um, bright stars, and uh, the result now um, is, is a medium term, and uh, it shows in the light of extreme choice, mm. flying RT, and we hope that the uh, Russian Revolution will step into the shoes sooner than later. Tell us about the membership. How does it work now? Because I mean, you know, you've had so much success. It's a great promotion for the brand, China Horse Club. But, but what is the interest in China and, and what, what do they get from being a member? Well, it had to go back to the original idea of, um, we realised uh, the time when we went Dubai and we noticed a lot of Asians slowly increasing the numbers to the uh, Dubai World Cup year after year. As you know, when we finished and completed the uh, Maidan race course we, in the year 2019, there were only a couple of hundred uh, actively participating the Asians in the racing industries. That include Vietnamese, the Thai, you know, so on and so forth. But over the years, um, the idea start to sort of concretize. And we thought the, um, if we have a club that will harness all this interest together, and then we started racing in China, uh, as you know, in 2013, and then followed up by in Singapore, we call it CCF. The idea is very similar to uh, present day's Everest. So member buying horses, each one has a slot, and race competitively yes. all around the world. Mm. So that momentum continue, 
and we have six uh, CCF in China. And now, um, two years ago, before the COVID, we have it in St. Lucia, which is also an ideal sort of a holiday island and settled between China and USA. So that kind of for other business reason. Oh no, I think the members are happy and a lot of them stay in and increase their investment portfolio with us. And first seal's going to be much too good, wins it by three. Winks is second. Take us back to the, the early days here in Australia, because you did wind up, you know, making some good contacts early on that helped you, particularly, you know, when it comes to your first group one winner, first seal. Well, um, that, I'm thankful, thankful for you raising this uh, episode here. When we first started, um, the person that actively and endorsing our concept was the late Datuk Tan Chin Nam as a Malaysian, as you can appreciate. And he then introduced me to uh, Duncan. Uh, and Duncan then introduced also, uh, brought in and, uh, the great legend, the late uh, Buck Cummings. So we decided we get enough budget uh, one year. Um, it wasn't big, it was about 400 over 1,000 to go to New Zealand to get some, some horses. And, um, and lo and behold, that was the biggest shock of my life. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we, uh, we bust the budget, and but uh, managed to get a horse we won. Uh, it was uh, over a, quart a three quarter of a million New Zealand dollars. And this horse um, then turned out to be first seal. That's how we started. And um, it, it, uh, it was uh, early on in, in the acquisition, even though um, the members soon for forgive me for, for, for so busting the budget, the budget. <laughs> but that also established a trend. Yes. And later on, we venture into uh, Europe and we got our first horse, a uh, stallion, Australia. Yes. And then uh, a couple of years later, we have a horse called Justify. Mm -hmm. And then, now we are happily uh, involved in uh, Say Inside. So basically, that complete in seven years our, our stallion trilogy. Yeah. We have uh, Epsom Derby. Yes. We have Kentucky Derby, yes. and now we have uh, the, the most uh, race that uh, people coveted for. Yes. That is the uh, Golden Slipper. Yes. So I'm happy to say that we are, um, so far the members are giving a thumbs up. You now are in these great bidding duels yourself with, with Newgate Farm as well when you're buying some of these yearlings or, or yourselves when you're buying fillies. I guess there's still always a budget though, isn't there? There has to be an upper limit. Oh yes, um, generally speaking there is. But uh, more often than not, sometimes uh, you really like something and uh, the kind of uh, hobby kicks in and uh, push the discipline aside. We can forgive some of the uh, shortcomings of extras or scope, but I think Justify is a perfect example of that story. That finally we, we got him, even though he didn't race as a two-year-old, but he came in as a champion and uh, as a three-year-old and continued within 112 days become the yeah. Triple Crown. Yeah. And when you see a horse such as him standing at stud, you know, obviously at Coolmore Stud here in the Hunter Valley here in New South Wales, you mu it must fill you with enormous pride. Yeah, I, I think um, not just because of the, um, it was successful and uh, it, it went to the very successful farm. In terms of the China Horse Club and the partners um, venture in the early days, in, within five years, I think we will be able to prove and convince to a lot of potential fan sitter to come on and come in and uh, that's where we are right now. Um, we are very fortunate to have very credible partners with us mm. along the way all these years mm. and uh, we are still with Kumo, sending our stallions. We are with um, Windstar in the United States and of course in, uh, in Australia here and Newgate and Henry Field and the team and mm. our partner in Gavin. I think I'm going to say that we are very uh, fortunate to have all the credible partners all these years. And you have, of course, the Chase, your own property too, where you've been staying, of course, with Ivy, your wife, through the whole, whole COVID thing for a few months now. It, it's a great thing, the way you're setting that up now, and you are taking in horses as, you know, spellers or adjust, horses to adjust as well. The Chase itself took a couple of years, and this is our six years in operation. Uh, only until this year, we think that the place are now a bit matured, and um, I think um, trainers have come and seen them. And uh, so far, we have quite a, a good line of uh, trainers sending their horses to spell over at the chase. And we are very happy about that, that um, it's so close to Sydney. And also, we use that place to, uh, to rest as well from Singapore when you come here. 
and I think the horses after the spell they looks good mm. really looks good what are you enjoying the most I mean you also have horses you've bred as well what do you enjoy the most between you know you obviously winning golden slippers is great but siring though you know having your, your stallions retire to start and the, and the race fillies as well to produce the next generation what what really gives you the biggest buzz in the industry I think from a commercial angle uh, last year was a big surprise to us that we have a sale topper uh, right in the midst of COVID, yes, it was a really pleasant surprise. Mm -hmm. And this year, I think she's uh, throwing out another uh, very beautiful uh, um, um, a piece of art. I would call them. Yeah. So all in, um, we are slowly evolving from not just racing and um, identifying all the elite brood mares that we had. Just uh, for within the last five months, we have thrown, produced two group ones in the United States mm -hmm. from our uh, brood mare band. And uh, Kimari won the uh, group one two days ago in the, in the medicine states. So overall in, in Australia and also in the Europe, yes. uh, we do have and uh, consolidate our Brookman band. Mm -hmm. And we believe that uh, the, the team behind this and the partnership, our band of the Brookman will continue to produce a winner. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and every one of them, the, um, the progeny are for sale. Our philosophy is that offer them reasonable price and let the market decide. And so far, I think the market has responded very positive to our philosophy mm. that if we like, really like yes. our own, yes. we go into the market and buy them back. Yes. Yeah, I try, try to buy them back. <laughs> if you can. That's uh, right, if yeah. I can, yeah. The idea of breeding is almost like going to school and learning all the arts and crafts. The biggest market that we would like to see opening up is, of course, China. And right now, uh, when we enter in Australia, the industries in 2013, there were only also a handful of people. But if you look at it now, yes. right? You Maybe. look at a big breeding yes. farm in Melbourne and yes. Victoria and Sydney. So we believe that the momentum will catch up. And uh, in a couple of years, when the market open up, well, we already, including our partners in Australia, in America, and even Europe, mm -hmm. that we can collectively um, uh, or contribute and offer something, our know-how, into that country. How do you think the wagering side? I mean, this is the big thing, isn't it, within China? Is there any easing of the of, of the attitude towards that? Well, Chinese uh, uh, members and the punters are are very aggressive. Mm. If you look at Hong Kong, yes. if you look at Macau, they do participate mm. actively. But if you look at their technological advancement in China, they're way ahead of many. They're using 5Gs. So we're talking about wagering. There must be a new way of um, the game mm. that involves the latest technology developed in that part of the world. Yes. And uh, currently we are also exploring how to um, put aside some of those concerns, yes. the, the bad effect, and be able to use the technology to circumvent. Mm -hmm. And I think they are very open-minded. Mm -hmm. And they, some of the regional leadership mm -hmm. are very open to ideas. Mm -hmm. and so this is currently the ongoing discussion. We're still um, sort of improving. Yes. And hopefully, for the next couple of years, the, the, we have reached a level that we can then be able to really tackle the challenge from China. That's our ultimate goal, Caroline. It's been a meteoric rise by Tio and the China Horse Club, and we look forward to seeing the red and gold colours saluting in big races for many years to come. Coming up on Bread to Win, the Cambridge Stud Performance of the Week, and Farm Life, a look behind the scenes at Cambridge, home to plenty of busy bees.
Cambridge starred performance of the week came from a daughter of a stallion who Cambridge have supported at the yearling sales, the unbeaten champion Frankel. Hungry Heart added the ATC Australian Oaks to her Vinery Stud Stakes Group 1 winning record as she dominated one of the world's great fillies classics. It was a magnificent result for Yulong Farms Yusheng Zhang, who's invested heavily in the Australian breeding industry. Hungry Heart went through the Magic Millions yearling sale for $300,000 and now has earnings of over $1.5 million. Now let's again go behind the scenes in Cambridge Studs Farm Life. <laughs> I don't know, a Kiwi up here that can do this, no? <laughs> what a chance of an Irishman and an Aussie man doing this video of Cambridge Studs. Yeah, in New Zealand. <laughs> in New Zealand. <laughs> Hi, I'm Trevor. And I'm Aaron. And today we're going to show you the hardest working people here. Oh no, no, I can't do that line. Can I just be just Aaron, me, Aaron? No, you got it. No, no, I don't have it. No, no. <laughs> Hi, I'm Trevor. And I'm Aaron. And today we're going to show you the hardest workers here at Cambridge Stud. Yeah, so the farm's looking really good, eh? It really is. Today we're here to harvest the honey. So we have 11 hives in here. And we're hoping to get 18 boxes of honey off it, hopefully. Plenty of nectar out there, as you can see our lavender here. In the background here we have our natives and in there is manuka and there's manuka through the farm as well. We have probably six or seven different spots in the farm that are all planted in natives that are all there for the bees. So they have a pretty good, there's some good pickings for them up here. They don't go hungry. Quick Trev, shut the gate before they escape me. Yeah, yeah, we don't want them getting out. You're not wrong Trev, that's a, that's a good crop. That is. Look at that. That's what we want to see. That's beautiful. Have you, have you come up with any names for them, Trev? I have. There's Barry. Bart. Brendan. Brendan. Can't call a bee Brendan. <laughs> the purpose of the bees on the farm here is for pollination. So they're here to pollinate the flowers, pollinate the paddocks. And they're doing a pretty good job with that. The upside then is we get all this lovely honey. And this lovely honey goes to feed the horses. So as well as the horses, the honey goes to climb to the stud. You know, it goes for Christmas presents. There's always a jar in the canteen for your, for your smoker. Who doesn't love a bit of honey on toast? Actually me, I'm not a huge fan of honey, but that's okay. Other people seem to like it. Don't know about yours, arm, but there's a bit of weight in this one. Ah, oh, I thought I'd put your back out that with all that honey. They can go out and forage, you know, all day and come back to an area like this with half a dozen hives and find their right home. The work they do, we can't do as humans. The pollination they do in the farm, we can't replicate that. Without bees, we wouldn't be here. Bees, incredibly small, but do a massive job. You wouldn't believe there were so many different parts to a thoroughbred stud farm and another beautiful story there from Cambridge Stud. Coming up on Bread to Win, popular breeder and owner Wilf Mueller in Arrowfield Studs, the horse who made you love racing. This segment brought to you by Arrowfield Stud, the brand worth its weight in gold. I think there's been so many fantastic horses, you know, during my time, but if I reflect, I suppose Kingston Town was really one that got my eye. It's when I was started to go into racing, and, you know, I remember going to Rose Hill, even though he was in Melbourne, for example, and, uh, you know, everyone used to say as he came down the straight, go the king, you know, and, they, and uh, to think he won about 18 races here undefeated. So I think he's the sort of horse that made me love racing, and. Uh, to look up at a magnificent animal like him to you know, win from six furlongs to nearly win a Melbourne Cup. Uh, so I think he had all the attributes of, uh, if you're passionate about racing, to say that's the sort of horse one day I hope I could own or, or be involved in. Yeah, does that passion, I mean, you've had so much success with a lot of horses, in particular Flying Artie, of yeah. course, in your lovely pink colours. You know, does that passion, do you, is it exactly the same feeling you get when you do have a horse such as him winning a Coolmore Stud Stakes, etc.? Oh, there's no doubt. I think uh, in those days I was just happy to be a part of a horse and, uh, and then with Paul Wheel and I started breeding horses and, you know, we got Fox Wedge together. That gave us a terrific thrill. I remember we hoped that we'd have a part of, of Fox Wedge, but uh, the doctor decided he wanted to race him on his own. But anyway, that's another story. And then, you know, of late, you know, to have bred Mama Reagan, 
I think uh, hopefully we haven't seen the best of him and uh, that's been a terrific thrill and uh, I think as I've got involved, I've now involved with Newgate, they do a great job. Uh, for me as a breeder, you know, not only my own farm and uh, hopefully the proof is in the pudding of what they've sold for me at Magic Million and here and I think later on we've got some nice horses coming in the future. So uh, hopefully we can get Flying Artie keep him going. And it is, it is the love of a horse that really attracts people to, to want to invest, isn't it? Oh yes, look, it's a very quick story, but when, as you know, I was born in Malta, and uh, when I was in Malta, I was eight years old, uh, my uncle said to me, oh, she said, he said, you're going to Australia. He said, uh, you know, horses in Australia are a penny each. And even though I was seven or eight, I said to him, oh, that means for a shilling I can have 12 of them. <laughs> and here's the story. <laughs> not quite a shilling these days, No, eh? not, not quite true, but I think, you know, it shows you Quantity is probably a better investment than maybe just one or two. Ah, he's the favourite of so many, isn't he? The great Kingston Town. That is bread to win for this week. Don't miss next week's show as we visit breaker extraordinaire Greg Bennett, the man who educated the Golden Slipper, Blue Diamond and Magic Millions winners this year. And Arrowfield Stud's delightful Susan Archer on the hospitality that keeps the buyers happy at a major sale. That's all next week. I'm Caroline Searcy. Look forward to seeing you then. Bread to Win, brought to you by Inglis, the Inglis May Sale Series. Mayors, Yearlings and Wheelings, Riverside Stables, May 2 to 9.